it's a cool story. It doesn't happen that much, but for a lot of coaches to be wrong and for the kid to be right. But when mama says she's right, mama's <laughs> normally right. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Always College Football. Today is Tuesday, September 27th. He's Mark Kubiak. I'm Greg McElroy. We really appreciate you being with us. It's been a great week up to this point. Got to revisit some of the games from the weekend yesterday, but we have a whole lot more to look forward to today, including our visit with Dino Babers. He's the head coach of Syracuse. They're 4-0. What an incredible 4-0 it is as well, by the way, with wins against Purdue and against Louisville and against Virginia. They are sitting pretty there. In the ACC, we'll visit with him, and we're going to go to the mailbag, and we're going to do finish the sentence. So a lot to look forward to here on the Tuesday edition of Always College Football. So without much further ado, let's talk about it. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. All right, we're now thrilled to be joined by a man that needs no introduction. He's the head coach of the Syracuse Orange. They are undefeated through the month of September. Coach Dino Babers joins us here on Always College Football. Coach, what's going on, man? Greg, how are you doing, sir? Uh, I'm doing excellent, Coach. Uh, as you know, you're part of the family, uh, family or part of the Ohana. Uh, you and my dad go way back, so I can always ask for a Dino Babers interview, and you have to say yes, right? That is that is accurate. Those are the island rules. Unfortunately, you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> no, my dad and Dino, dad was a graduate assistant on Hawaii there in, what, 81 or so. Dad played at Hawaii. And then, of course, Dino, a couple years later, having played at Hawaii, uh, they intersected, and Dad and Dino were very, very close. Dad loves Dino. Dad now roots for three teams in his household. Hawaii, anyone playing against Arizona State, uh, Syracuse, and I guess Alabama. So I guess four teams if you include our team. So <laughs> Dino and Dad go way back. So, Coach, we are so, so thrilled that you're having the success that you're having. We've been a fan forever. Uh, as we have to be. But, man, what a great start to the year. Well, thank you so much. Now, Greg, you got to understand one thing. I mean, your dad, he's a very, very smart man. So those four, those four games, you know, <laughs> I can understand that, and I think he's got great foresight. Yeah, no doubt about it, man. Let's talk about your team. I think there's nothing more remarkable than watching a guy change and evolve uh, over the course of a tenure at one specific place because I've seen you now – You've when you got to Syracuse, like, hey, we're going to throw it all over the yard, and you transitioned and have adjusted kind of your personnel every year. Now you're a run-centric team with both your quarterback and your run game, but the passing game's coming along as well. How is it that you're constantly able to evolve, Coach? Well, I think a lot of this goes back to your, your dad and where I, I started at. When we were at the University of Hawaii, we had some fantastic tailbacks, uh, uh, David Teleumu, uh, Gary Allen, uh, Anthony Egger, we had these tailbacks that were awesome. And then all of a sudden, you know, that kind of dried up a little bit. And, and Coach Tomey, who's passed away, switched over to some young offensive coordinator by the name of June Jones <laughs> with some type of offense called run and shoot. And then we're in the run and shoot offense with, uh, you know, Rafael Cherry and June Jones being the coordinator. And, and then that evolved on to uh, Garrett and all these other guys that created uh, Timmy Chang that's got the records for all the yards passing. And to be able to evolve and really work with the personnel that you have and not put a square, a square peg into a round hole, I think, is the key. And then having a little flexibility in, on how you believe you can move the football. Coach, I've been really impressed with with Garrett Schrader, and and I know maybe maybe last week not not the sharpest week, or you know whatever it may be, it doesn't matter. Either way, though, I've been very impressed with the way he's grown 
I mean, you look at those first couple of weeks, that was as accurate as I'd ever seen him uh, as, a, as a passer at the college level, whether it be at Mississippi State or at your place. We knew he was a great athlete, great runner, but now you're starting to see things starting to kind of evolve as far as how he feels in the pocket. So how have you accelerated his development, and why is it that this year the light appears to have gone on so he's a multidimensional player? Well, I, I think it's – I think it's – I think it's, it's – there's two prongs to this thing. A, I think he really – you know, Gary's one of those guys that gets a chip on his shoulder. He really wants to prove a lot of people wrong that, you know, wanted to switch a position and move him right. around. And I can, being a quarterback that got his position changed when I went to the University of Hawaii, I can, I can understand that chip on his shoulder. So he really, really wants to do well, and he works really, really hard on it. But the other part is i got to give the credit to Robert and I, who is another, yeah. uh, even though he's a BYU graduate, he actually <laughs> did his graduate assistant work at the University of Hawaii along with uh, Jason Beck, who's a BYU graduate. Who would ever thought that the Rainbows and the Cougars would be working in the same room? Because if you know anything about rivalries, that is about as intense as you can get back in the day when, <laughs> when we were rolling through there in the late 70s and early 80s. Right. But uh, I think those two, those two men, along with Schrader himself working together, has made the big turnaround, and we're really excited about his development. So you're saying that there is absolutely nothing to do with the fact that he trimmed his beard up a little bit? Because I was convinced there for a bit the beard affected his vision. I, I don't know. Maybe it did, but I don't know. You tell me. Well, I think what it really affected is his helmet comes off more. Because before, <laughs> it used to be really stout, and you couldn't get that dog ain't, doggone thing off. And now we've had three or four times where the backup quarterbacks had to come in in the last four games because his helmet comes off a lot easier. Definitely noticed that for sure. It does, however, look when he runs the when he leaves the pocket. Does it look like he's barely running? Because that does stress me out a little bit. It feels like he's moving and no one's really catching him. But man, it's like Garrett, run! Like go, <laughs> please run faster. You know he has he has a gait about him. Everyone he doesn't look like his legs are really turning over very quickly. But right. when you get into the chase part of it, when he's opened up, he can go now. It takes a while for those little guys to run them down. No, there's no doubt about it. How about your running back coach, Sean Tucker? I, I've been amazed with him for as long. It hasn't really happened for him just the, this year, but you know, it's only a matter of time. It, it's only a matter of time before he really gets going and starts to find some really open lanes. So uh, how do you kind of get him going, knowing that he is such an incredible back, one of the best we have in college football? You know, it's, it's, he's the last thing I was, I, the last person I was talking to before I came to this interview, I was in the training room. And uh, he's on his table once again, taking care of his body. And Sean is such a unique person. He's such a fantastic person. Anybody that meets him that's around him, they're just, they do nothing but pull for him. I've got my former number one uh, draft pick, Trung Candidate from the University of Arizona Wildcats. He's texting me, you know, after every game talking about Sean Tucker and how we're using him and all these stuff. He's got everybody in the world pulling for him. And I know good right. things are going to happen to him. Uh, down the road because you just can't keep putting that guy up to bat and not expect him to start hitting home runs like Mr. Judge. Still wait for him to hit 61, but he'll get it done either today or tomorrow on the road, I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. It does feel like it's only a matter of time, though. Every time he ca he gets the football, you as a, if you're just looking at it from a defensive coordinator's perspective, you kind of hold your breath. It's like, oh, boy, they, you know, he could go the distance at any moment. It just hasn't quite happened yet. He's not, I mean, he's not getting frustrated, is he? Because it's it's only a matter of time. You know how young people get frustrated early. Old people, it takes us a while to get frustrated, maybe because we've been already frustrated a lot sometimes <laughs> right. in life. But, right. uh, you know, Steve, I mean, Sean is, excuse, is extremely confident, and uh, he knows what he can do, and he knows it's only a matter of time. He's, a, he's on the launching pad. It's only a matter of time before he takes off. No, we're excited for that. That's for sure, Coach. You guys are, are playing great on that side of the football. Uh, Coach and I, as you referenced, has done a great job of, of kind of adjusting things and, uh, and kind of tinkering with things and making sure that you guys have the lead at the end of the game, even though last week, maybe not your best second half performance either way, a win's a win. Uh, transitioning to the defensive side of the football and, and just how that group's played, there have been some great moments. There have been some moments where you're just nervous as can be. I mean, the Purdue game kind of comes to mind, but – uh, what can you say collectively about that group as a whole and, and just how they're playing? You know, they have that mob mentality. They've mm -hmm. nicknamed the defense the mob. And uh, I'm really proud about not only the way they've kept us in games until offensively we could get going, but how they've always come up with the big play. The turnovers are way up. Defensive stops are way up. 
red zone red zone numbers are down, which is good for the defense. And I just think that uh, they're the they're the key to this football team because they were good last year when maybe the offense wasn't that good, and now that the offense is looking a lot better, uh, they're still good. And uh, Coach Tony White does a fantastic job on that side of the ball. We've got some NFL cats on that side of the ball. There's no doubt about it. Our last game with Virginia was like the most scouts I've ever seen here except for <laughs> when they had the quarterback from Liberty here. And I think maybe a lot of those guys were watching the quarterback from Liberty, which was last year. Right. But I mean, we, the dome was packed with NFL scouts. Uh, it was either 20 or 30 of them or somewhere in between, that's for sure. And uh, they're all coming, coming here to look at a whole bunch of guys on the offensive side of the ball, there's no doubt, but also on that defensive side of the ball, maybe even more so. Yeah, was, I remember that Liberty game well, by the way. It was a Friday night. Uh, and you guys, you guys, man, I, I'm not going to say you were the reason why Malik Willis slipped to the third round, but you didn't help matters, that's for sure. Uh, you guys gave him fits all, all night long, that's for sure. You got Wagner coming up this week. Um, not saying that this is a, you know one where you're looking ahead or anything like that, but it, it is kind of nice to finally be able to take a breath because it's been a bit of a murderer's row for you guys. Louisville to start the season – tough game in conference. Then you got obviously Purdue, a team that won nine games last year. Virginia, who's a very dangerous team. It just feels like a matter of time before they flip the switch and get going offensively. So what can you say about who you have to, have had to play here in September and just the challenges that your team has had to experience already? You know, when before the season started, we had uh, someone said we had the third toughest schedule in the country. We were playing, I think it was like seven or eight bowl teams uh, out of the 25 teams that we were playing. Uh, Purdue was ranked in the top 25 and went and they beat Tennessee in a bowl game last year. Virginia qualified for a bowl game last year. Uh, and now we're sitting here and we've got Wagner coming up, which we have the utmost respect for. Right. Uh, Tom Masella does a, a, a fantastic job. I know that guy. He's a fantastic coach, good family man. And I've been in those games. You know, one of the reasons I'm sitting in this chair in Syracuse is 2013. I took an FCS school to San Diego State and we were 21 point dogs and we're playing at their place and we ended up winning the game. And all of a sudden people started saying, who's this Dino Babers guy? <laughs> and from there I started moving up. But I under, I've been in those games. I know that they'll pull out all the stops. And Greg, you know me. I mean, this is all about being one and zero at the end of this week, and not being some of that thing on ESPN and Sports Center. Da da not, da da not, flash. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I don't want to show up on the bottom of the ticker with one of those flash things. So we need to make sure we handle our business, and the rest of the season will come to us. You're uniquely qualified to answer this question, and we've theorized on Always College Football now for the last few weeks. Coach, those upsets that you just referred to, FCS over FBS, uh, Marshall over Notre Dame, App State over Texas A&M, uh, Middle Tennessee State over Miami, it doesn't feel as rare anymore because of the transfer portal and how, yes, yeah, guys are going up in some cases to the highest levels of football, but don't forget about all those guys that are on power five big time programs that are going down now to the marshals of the world and now are capable and getting opportunities to potentially tackle some of the giants. So you're uniquely qualified. You've been all over the place. You've seen a lot of different stops, a lot of different places, a lot of different levels of football. Why is it you think that we have so much parity between the, the P5 and the G5, the G5 and the FCS, and all things in between? Greg, I think you nailed it. Uh, you know, I don't want to tell people, you know, I will never tell people how to do their jobs, but how about a thought right here? You know, when you think about FCS programs, a lot of times people want to hire the young upcoming coach that'll make a move and, and go, you know, we'll hire him for three or four years, and then he'll go somewhere and we'll hire somebody else. Have you ever thought about hiring an, an older coach who goes down and this is an example of me. And when when you're down, if that if that older coach is running an, a, uh, an aggressive offense or a style that attracts people from the power five, or they're running a style of defense where if you play this the certain skills in this defense well, you're attractive to uh, NFL scouts, that those young men will move down just as well as the guys from FCS moving up. And as you know, the 
NFL, they'll find you anywhere. I mean, I watched my guy oh, Jimmy yeah. Garoppolo on TV last night. Now he did touch the back of the end zone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I watched him, you know, and and he came from the FCS. And when I got there, they didn't even know what they had. I mean, I'm like, I looked at him. I'm like, what is he doing here? He shouldn't be here. This this quarterback should be at power five. But uh, there's players everywhere. And the one thing about the National Football League is that they have enough money to find them. Yeah, there's no denying that. And the guy he replaced, also an FCS guy, and Trey Lance, uh, of course, went to, went to North go. Dakota State. Uh, another example, I think uh, Trey Lance had one Power 5 offer or one, and it might have been like, way down the list on the power five. Now you've found diamonds in the rough coach. I mean, you've found that you've had highly recruited guys. You've also found guys that were maybe under recruited that have you developed. And then you've found guys via the transfer portal Schrader being an example of that, that, that are now being pivotal impact players on your roster. So how have you put your roster together to make sure you kind of take from all areas and make sure you're also developing uh, from within as well? Well, there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot more to it. Now we've increased our recruiting department. You have to, uh, you're looking at high school kids. You're now looking at junior college kids. And then you are looking at, uh, you know, portal transfer kids. And the biggest thing is, you know, although a candy store has all type of candies in it, you know, there's only certain candies that I'll reach for. And if you know what you're getting, then you're a lot better off than just sticking your hand in a grab bag and pulling it out and wondering what it's going to taste like. So we're very particular in what we go for. And, uh, the personalities behind some of these athletes also matter because we've got to make sure they fit our culture and not when they come here, it's going to be their culture. Well, you, you're such an incredible person, coach. And I've, I've obviously, I love you. You know that we go way back and, and I think the world of you and the pr type of program that you've created, but what are some of those qualities you look like within a personality uh, when evaluating all the possibilities that you might add when looking at the portal and high school guys and all that, all those other things that you have to consider? Greg, are we going to write a book? Or are you going to give me some dibs on this? <laughs> you're, you're, well, you're if I could write, I, I struggle right with, I struggle with when to use the semicolon. I struggle to when to use the comma. Uh, I have a lot of run on sentences, coach. I'm not sure you want me to tell the story, but I will read. I will gladly read the audio book. How's that sound? You know, here, here, here's the big thing. You, to me, you want guys who overachieve. And overachievers are normally people who will listen, allow someone to have their opinion. Sometimes they agree with them and sometimes they disagree with them. Everybody has the right to agree or, or they have the right to disagree, but they have a lot of self-confidence in themselves. And, uh, you know, I mentioned Trump candidate earlier in the, in the broadcast and Trump candidate was a person that came in as a running back we moved him to wide receiver. He didn't look great. We moved him to defensive back. He didn't look great. And I still remember this. He's going to get mad. I still remember this. His mom came in and had a personal meeting with me and said, Coach, we, Trung really wants to play running back. And at the time, we had a basically what would a, a, basically a four or five star tailback from a very prominent school. I'm not going to say his name. Right. Very prominent school. He was never going to play. He was not going to play in front of that kid. And and I said, man, Trung won't play. He'll get no chance to play. But he'll be behind this guy forever. And she said he is a running back at heart, and he'd rather play be second team or third team running back than play something else. And that was a strong statement from a mom. I don't even right. know if Trung knows this story. But I said, <laughs> okay, as long as he knows that and you know that he may not play, we'll move him back there. We moved him back. And – uh went through the spring and the guy was better than Trung and he was going to play. And uh, I'm almost saying the other running back's name, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> and he, and the other running back got hurt in spring. He hurt his knee in spring, a fluke thing. And uh, he wasn't able to play the next year. And, and then Trung ended up beating out all the other tailbacks and uh, Lord and behold, ended up being a first round draft pick with the St. Louis Rams and the other guy could never beat him out again. So it's one of those rare stories where everything worked out right, but it was it all came down to the the faith and the belief that the mom and the trunk had in himself. And yeah. uh, it's a cool story. It doesn't happen that much, but for a lot of coaches to be wrong and for the kid to be right. But when mama says she's right, 
Mom is normally right. <laughs> hey, there, hey, there's also there's a, that there's one there's two takeaways in that story. One, mom is always right. Two, coaches that are willing to admit when they're wrong are rare. So I think that's also uh, a really nice quality there, Coach. Awesome stuff. Great to visit with you. Congrats on success. I would tell you congrats on 4-0, but I know you don't care about that. Uh, I'll just say good luck going 1-0 this week against WAG. Greg, that's exactly what you could say to get me <laughs> fired up. If we can be 1-0 when this is all said and done, hey, it'll be a blessing. That being said, remember, Junior, okay, <laughs> Senior gave you – a surname. Yes. And that surname had something to it. Okay. Your number one goal is not to embarrass the surname that he gave you. That, that is accurate. That is without question. But as long as he doesn't embarrass the surname either, we're in good shape. All right. I'll tell you what. It's, that's the reason why I had all daughters right there. Yeah. <laughs> awesome job, Coach, man. So appreciate you. Good luck this week. We'll talk to you soon. All right. See you, Greg. All right, here we are, the end of September, and it's time to get into a, a few different superlatives, if you will. So an interesting way that we're trying to do that is to finish the sentence. So we'll allow Coobs to kick it off. Let's see what we got. All right, Greg, finish this sentence. The most surprising 4-0 team at the end of September is... The Kansas Jayhawks. All right, right there. And this is not a Kansas shirt. All right, it's just a blue shirt. All right. But if it did have a Jayhawk logo on it, I would wear it proudly. I do have a Kansas shirt, I might add, that came with the helmet. So very excited about rocking the Jayhawks. Rock Shock Jayhawks. You are by far the most surprising team in the college football world because you've gone on the road. You've won a couple games. You're sitting pretty right now. I'm not surprised you beat Duke. Uh, I'm not really that surprised you took care of this week one, obviously. But I am surprised that in back-to-back -back weeks, you go to West Virginia pull off a stunner against what I think is a pretty solid football team. And then you go to Houston, a team that started the season ranked in the top 25, a team that won, what, 11 or 12 games last year, and a team that most thought might be the best team in the group of five. Not only did you beat them, but Houston hasn't been the same since. You got fighting on the sideline. You basically broke them. What I think is most interesting about Kansas right now is that their quarterback is having generationally good stats. All right, Jalen Daniels right now, he is registered at least a 95 total QBR in four consecutive games. All right. That's the longest streak to begin a season. It's pretty crazy dating back to a metric that debuted in 2004. All right. So Tua Tungavaloa, Lamar Jackson, and Mac Jones are the only other qu quarterbacks that have strung together three or more QBR games of 95 plus. Jalen Daniels, of course, four consecutive games to open the season. They're also the four best performances in school history. That's right. Todd Reesing back in 2007 against Nebraska posted a total QBR of 95. Okay. That's the fifth best performance in school history. The top four are the first four games of the 2022 season from Jalen Daniels. So it's amazing to watch what we've seen from that young man. It's amazing to watch what we've seen from this offense as a whole. And I think they're going to be a legitimately difficult out here at times in the Big 12 season. Now, all that being said, they could still finish four and eight. All right. It could very easily happen. So they got to continue to chop wood, but it's been a really exciting September for the Jayhawks. No love for Washington? That's kind of a surprise. They were 4-8 and eight I'm last not year, that surprised. Back. I'm not that surprised. I'm not that surprised. But they also were under consideration as far as the 4-0 and o teams and the undefeated teams. Look, there's only 21 undefeated teams remaining in college football. All right? So several of which, when you really start going down the list, several of which are pretty dang surprising. Syracuse, another very surprising undefeated. Uh, I thought you were definitely going with Cuse having Dino on the show. This was going to be the all Q show too. So okay. well, okay. we do appeal. We do appeal to the Syracuse squad uh, of broadcasters. We want to make sure we get great consideration for postseason awards. Um, so we always have to consider Q Syracuse. But no, uh, no, we are not going down that rabbit hole just yet. Because if you really look at it, Syracuse, what they brought back, the fact that they're sitting where they're at is not totally shocking, and the fact that they've been at home. In several of their first few games, like all of their first few games, uh, that helps as well. So I love Syracuse, proud of Syracuse, but no, Kansas is without question the most surprising 4-0 team. 
All right, moving on. Finish this sentence. The ACC Coastal is? Well, I think I'll let Denny Green explain it. But they are who we thought they were, and we let them off the hook. All right, not necessarily letting them off the hook, but this is pretty much what I thought it was going to be in the Coastal. It's a jumbled mess. All right, every single week, not really sure what to make of it. Do you realize right now that Virginia Tech sits atop the Coastal? That's right. Virginia Tech, laugh. the same team that lost to Old Dominion in week one of the football season is currently leading the ACC Coastal. Now, hey, credit to them. Win's a win. Tons of credit for the win. But the fact that they are currently in the lead tells you all you need to know. Okay? The league and the division as a whole, you already have one coach that's been fired. All right? North Carolina can't defend. Duke hasn't played anybody and just lost to Kansas. Doesn't mean, they, by the way, that might be a good loss. We'll, we'll find out as the season goes along. But I'm not sitting here expecting Duke to be in the mix at season's end. I don't like Virginia Tech at all. I think they're very up and down, but might be better. It's, I think they're a bowl team, potentially, but not sure. I really respect them to you know get out of the coastal. Uh, Pitt, I think Pitt's pretty good. Uh, I'll give you Pitt, but it's not a, a bona fide no-doubter that they're going to be sitting there at the end because they're a little up and down as well. You could have made a case that Pitt could have lost week one to West Virginia. They didn't play great in that game. They found a way to win, but they didn't play great in that game by any stretch of the imagination. Miami just lost to Middle Tennessee. have lost two in a row. Looked awful in the process in each of the last two games. I mean, Virginia can't play offense based on where they were a year ago. Meanwhile, their defense has taken significant strides forward, and they were awful on defense last year. Uh, so you tell me what... The ACC Coastal is because I personally have no idea what I'm getting from any of those few teams. In the preseason, I thought it'd be a three horse race. I thought it'd be a North Carolina versus Miami versus Pitt. I don't trust Miami at all. I think they got major growing pains. I think there's going to be some issues as they move along throughout the season. So I think it could come down to North Carolina against Pitt. Right now, I don't love what I'm seeing from North Carolina's defense. So give me Pitt right now. But anyway, you slice it. It's difficult to kind of discern once you get beyond Pitt exactly what the pecking order may be. All right, staying with a the conference theme, finish this sentence, Greg. The Big Ten West is going to go through Minneapolis. Minnesota is the best team in the Big Ten West. Now, are they going to be undefeated at season's end? I, I can't answer that. But if you look at the metrics and statistically speaking, they are really, really solid. We know they can run the football. We know that Morgan's a veteran quarterback. Still not 100% sold on their passing attack. Think that that could become something that could become problematic as the game and the season moves along. But either way, you look at it, man. I don't trust Iowa. Do you trust Iowa offensively? Granted, step in the right direction last week, but we're going to find out this week. They welcome Michigan to town. So we're going to find out all we want to know about Iowa this week. Northwestern. Yeah, they're 1-0 currently in division, as shocking as that may be, but have lost three straight since they won their game in Ireland against the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Fighting Illini are very dangerous. All right? I will admit this. I wasn't sure what to make of Illinois coming into the season. They are a very dangerous football team. That could, team could easily be 4-0. Instead, they're 3-1, and and if not for the drive given up there on that Friday night to Indiana to allow Indiana off the hook, Illinois would be in a really strong position to be atop the division. I think that's by far right now, based on what I've seen, the biggest threat to Minnesota. Purdue is a little too one-dimensional, and Aiden O'Connell being a little beat up concerns me as they move a little bit forward. Wisconsin, to me, is so lethargic offensively, and defensively, they look very human. I know they did against Ohio State. I get that um, anyone's going to look somewhat human. Uh, on defense against Ohio State, but can they score enough points to knock off a team like Minnesota with the way Minnesota's playing defense in a rivalry game? Have a difficult time seeing that. And Nebraska, don't even get me started with Nebraska. All right, no one makes me more upset than them. They've given up 122 points this year, uh, or 142 points this year, by the way. That is about uh, 35 points clear of the second worst defense in 
all of the Big Ten West, second worst defense being the team that beat them. That's right, the Northwestern Wildcats. So everything right now in the Big Ten West is set up for Minnesota to go to the Big Ten Championship game. And I actually think they could be very competitive in that setting as well. All right, moving along now, time to interact with our outstanding listeners. We appreciate you hitting us up in the mailbag. You can do it as well at alwayscollegefootball at gmail.com. All right, send us your questions. We'll get them on the air. We're going to try to get the more mailbag questions as the season goes along too because we're starting to stockpile and the pile is starting to get a little too big. So it's time It's time to, I think, start reeling some of these off. So we'll try to get a few more in. Maybe we'll get to a point where we do a question to show, maybe two questions to show here in the near future. So submit them at alwayscollegefootball at gmail.com. So Mark, let's kick it off. All right. This one comes from Ryan in Los Angeles. Is UCLA getting enough credit? Their stats through four games are almost identical to USC. Why no love for the Bruins? A couple of reasons why. Okay. Everyone remembers the performance against South Alabama. And while people are not going to necessarily pay attention to South Alabama, they're going to look and they're going to say, well, they needed a field goal at the buzzer to be able to knock off the Jaguars from South Alabama down in Mobile. Well, what people don't know is that South Alabama is really good, and that was a fairly decent win. I think when you look at UCLA, the performance against Colorado, off the charts good. The performance against South Alabama, not great. And the performance against Bowling Green, if I'm going to be completely honest, substandard as well. They came out of the gates a little slow against Bowling Green, looked a little lethargic, got things going in the second half of that football game and inevitably pulled away. But it was far from a great performance for UCLA whatsoever. So I think teams will and people will start to pay major attention to the Bruins. You look at the stats, all right? Look at the stats side by side against USC. And everyone knows USC, it's God's gift to football. They're the greatest football team in the history of the world. Stats will back that up as well. I, of course, say that tongue-in-cheek. I have a ton of respect for USC. Uh, Their win and the guts that they showed to go on the road last week to Corvallis to take care of business and force the turnovers that they forced, which inevitably gave them the game, was great. It was a resilient win. And when their offense had nowhere near their best stuff, they still found a way. You got to give credit where credit is due. But USC is sitting in the top six comfortably. UCLA currently unranked. The records are identical. The stats in some ways are identical as well. Here's what I would tell you if you're UCLA. It doesn't matter. Okay, you haven't beaten anyone of significance and you didn't win the offseason. All right. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter at this point. What you can do is take care of business the next three weeks against Washington this weekend. That'll be at home. That'll be the night game. Pac-12 after dark. That'll be 1030 Eastern time on ESPN. I actually like UCLA in this game against Washington. More on that a little later in the week. Then you take care of business at home again. Hopefully there'll be more than 2,500 people in the Rose Bowl to watch this one. Utah will travel to Los Angeles to take on the Bruins. That'll be on October 8th. And then if that wasn't enough, they'll take a bye week on on October 15th. They'll welcome... Uh, They'll go on the road, excuse me, to be welcomed in by the Oregon Ducks. So your next three games are against ranked competition. Who cares where you're at right now? You win two of the next three, you are cooking with gas, all right? If you can take care of business this weekend against Washington, I like your chances. You're going to be in the top 25. And if you could take care of business next weekend against Utah, you might find yourself in the top 15. So don't worry. The voters and the respect will come. You just have to build it. And unfortunately, at this point, you haven't done enough in the public eye to warrant the consideration of being ranked in the top 25 at this point. I'm sorry, we're talking about Kansas? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. They should be in the top 25, not UCLA. All right, moving on. Laura in Minneapolis. It looks like there won't be any group of five teams crashing the CFP this year. Will we see a first-time team make it? in or are we set for Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, and Clemson? It's a great question. And at this point, it's very difficult for me to assume that there's a team that is going to be 
in the college football playoff for the first time. Uh, why? Because right now it certainly feels like we are looking at a situation where Bama and Georgia are going to be ranked one and four, or three, or however it all sorts itself out. And you're going to have Ohio State. So those are three teams that are going to take up three spots. No matter how it all sorts itself out, it does feel like Alabama and Georgia are on a collision course, 12-0. and 0. Both are going to be 12-0 and 0 potentially in the college football playoff. However, I would say this. I would not be surprised if, say, Georgia beat Tennessee, Tennessee beat Alabama, and Tennessee sitting there at 11-1 to 1, getting consideration for that fourth playoff spot. But is the committee really going to put three SEC teams? I have a very difficult time anticipating that. I also think there's an outside chance that NC State, we're going to find out about them this week, if they can take care of Clemson, they could be incredibly well positioned to find their way to the ACC championship game where they're going to beat, like we talked about earlier, where they're going to potentially be a pretty heavy favorite against an ACC Coastal Division champion. And maybe NC State can find their way into the college football playoff. And then how about USC? USC has not made the college football playoff. As shocking as that may be, USC has not made it. Now, I haven't seen anything at this point that gives me faith that they're going to find their way to the playoff because I think they're playing with in a, in a house of cards a little bit. Yes, they're living and thriving right now off the turnover, but whatever happens if they play against a team that doesn't turn the ball over? Whatever happens if they play against a team that can run the football with great conviction, will they be able to hold up up front? Those are questions that I still have for the Trojans. So I think the teams, if I had to say, hey, the first time college football playoff participants that are on my radar, SC would be one, NC State would be one, Oklahoma State would be one, obviously out of the Big 12. Pac-12, I think, has a very real chance. Even if SC doesn't make it, I wouldn't be shocked if UCLA found their way into the discussion. I wouldn't be shocked if Utah continues to play at a really high level, at a really high clip. I wouldn't be shocked if a two-loss champion from the Power Five gets into the college football playoff this year. So there's still a lot of teams that are very much in consideration. But if I had to bet it right now, will that fourth team, assuming the top three hold serve, will that fourth team be a team that had already been in the playoff? My bet would be yes. We'll see. Uh, it should be really, really interesting if things continue the way that they're going right now. Thanks for being with us today. It's awesome to talk to Dino Babers a little earlier in the show. It's great to get into the mailbag. It's great to have some superlatives here at this point of the season. It's the end of September, man. We are a quarter of the way through this thing. Let's continue to try to learn as much as we can here in the next couple of weeks so that we are well positioned to discuss college football in October and in November, and we can do so intelligently. All right, we'll do that. We're going to do that together. All right. Thanks so much for being with us. Please like, rate, and subscribe wherever you're getting the content. Please tell your friends about it too. The word of mouth in our line of work is extremely, extremely helpful. So it's on the ESPN YouTube channel. You can only rate, just hit that thumbs up button. That's all you can do on there and share it with your friends. All right. If you're on podcast, you can actually subscribe. You can also rate five stars, please on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. So that's really beneficial as well. Those will download and auto-populate so you can listen to those things when you're on the road or when you're on the move or if you can't sit down in front of your computer screen and watch the ESPN YouTube channel. So we really appreciate the interaction that we're getting from you. It's been awesome so far, and we're almost at the end of September. So let's keep this good thing going. For Mark Kubiak, I'm Greg McElroy. I hope you have an incredible day. We'll be back tomorrow with 10 questions, so make sure you tune in for that. For all of us here at Always College Football, we'll see you tomorrow. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.